Have you ever been to a place where you totally felt that, does this sound okay? It sounds kind of echoey for me, but. Um, where you felt, you can just bring it down a bit. Testing one, two, three. Okay. Uh, have you ever been to a place where you totally felt that you recognized? In fact, you're so sure that you'd been here before, despite the fact that you've never actually been there before. I had that experience when I went to England for the first time. And I would go, that looks so familiar. This house looks very familiar. This looks right. And then I realized it's because I'd grown up watching English movies. <laughs> British movies. I mean, I was living in a British colony watching British movies. So I was like, oh, that's why that looks familiar. Well, you know, but, but there are people who've gone to places and they're like, oh, I know this place. Uh, have you ever met a person that you felt you used to know sometime before, despite the fact that you've never met them before? This movie, Dead Again, it's a really funny movie. It's actually quite hilarious. It's about reincarnation. But the, the interesting thing is uh, Kenneth Branagh, who, who was then at that mar time married to Emma Thompson, um, he said, well, I mean, yeah, if, if you forget the fact that reincarnation is totally ridiculous, it's actually a funny movie, and it is. So the, even the movie himself said he didn't believe in it. But it's a great movie. I enjoyed it. Uh, it's kind of weird, and that, that kind of adds to it. Uh, and, but how about deja vu? We've all had deja vu, right? It's deja vu all over again, right? So, uh, but maybe it was deja vu in a slightly different, you know, it was similar but different, and then you remembered it. Uh, now, you can't explain this, but if you've had a previous life, and if you've been born before, that would seem to explain these occurrences. Uh, if you'd existed before and visited those places or made friends with certain people, then you may uh, feel, that, oh, they were also in their past life. Then you met them. You're like, oh, yeah, I remember you from a past life, which is what Dead Again is all about. Um, I was once working at LSI Logic, and I was talking to a friend of mine, and they're at work, and he was very interested in the fact that I was from India. Now, you have to remember, this is way back in the 80s when there weren't many Indians all over the Valley, right? Uh, and um, I have to tell you the story. So you know what happens when there aren't many Indians in Silicon Valley. If you're walking down the street and you see another Indian coming down the other side of the street, you do the little, right? <laughs> Touch it. And then, and then, because I was single, they would like cross the street and start talking to me. And they'd want to know where I came from, where my family was. You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to figure out if I was a good candidate for an arranged marriage. Right? Because this is what they do, right? And you know, my parents were, uh, I would get all these emails, or not emails, no emails back then. I'd get these letters like, there's a really nice girl who lives there in Arizona. You should go meet her. I'm like, mom, <laughs> you know. I, I did. I actually met a whole bunch. I met like, I met a model for Toyota. I met a dentist. I met a whole bunch of these. And I, and I just, I had to do it the hard way. I had to find the most beautiful American girl and, and convince her to marry me. But, but anyway, so, uh, so this guy was like very interested that I was from India because there weren't that many Indians there. Um, and he'd say, and, and he said, look, I've always wanted to visit India. So I said, well, why? Why do you want to visit India? You know, I'm, I'd left there. <laughs> why do you want to go there? And he says, well, that's because where Buddhism originated. Now, some people think that's a, a Chinese, kind of a Japanese, Korean religion, but it really originated in India, right? Um, and I said, oh, that's nice. What's so special about Buddhism? I mean, you're, you're white. You must be a Christian kind of thing. This is early in the day. I said, well, he said, well, he'd been reading about the Dalai Lama. I said, well, Dalai Lama is in Tibet. Not India. He says, well, he knew that, but being as that Tibet had been occupied by China for the last 20 years, now you know how long it is, I wrote this, he couldn't very, very well visit Tibet, and that's why he wanted to visit Nepal and India. I said, well, that's very nice, but what's all this attraction to Buddhism in the first place? He says, well, they found the Dalai Lama in Mexico or somewhere. I said, I thought he was Tibetan. What's the Dalai Lama doing in Mexico if he's in Tibet? He says, well, they didn't know where the Dalai Lama was, and they found him in Mexico. I said, well, that's very nice. I didn't know he was hiding in Mexico. He said, no, he wasn't hiding there. Well, I said, well, in that case, I, don't know, I didn't know that he was lost. He said, no, no, he wasn't lost. He was dead. I said, wait, I thought you said he was in Mexico. He said, well, well yes, but it wasn't him. I said, well, if it wasn't him in Mexico, then what was he doing not being in Mexico when he was dead? 
He says, well, you see, my, my friend said, well, he died and come back to life as a young boy in Mexico. I said, oh, uh, how do you know that this boy in Mexico is the Dalai Lama? Does the boy claim to be the Dalai Lama? He said, no, not, he doesn't. I said, then why do they think he's the Dalai Lama? He says, well, the vice Dalai Lama in chief or someone went looking for him and found him in Mexico. And I said, well, how did this vice Dalai Lama figure out that this boy who didn't himself know that he was a Dalai Lama figured out the Dalai Lama was the Dalai Lama? He said, well, that's where you have to have faith. Faith in the signs and the stars that indicate that the boy is the Dalai Lama. I said, well, does the boy like being told he's the Dalai Lama? And he said, well, I'm not sure. But that's why I want to go to India. I think this is fascinating. Right? Now, I found out my friend had his story all mixed up. It wasn't the Dalai Lama. It was the Pantin Lama. Right? And there's a whole bunch of other things around this story. Um, and, and, uh, and, but many people are fascinated by this whole thing about reincarnation because it's very interesting. And he thinks, well, he was like, well, this is obvious. This is obviously a case of reincarnation. Here's a kid who's the reincarnation of the Panchen Lama or whatever. And um, there are many hundreds of incidents that seem to prove it. So uh, but here's the question, and most of you know this, so I don't need to repeat it, but I'll repeat it for the live stream. Uh, why is it important that we have the answer? Now, a while ago, I was talking to a young lady, and she asked me, she said, why do you think this is an important issue to study? She said, as far as she was concerned, she believed in Jesus. And she didn't care what anybody else said. That was enough for her. She believed in Jesus. So it doesn't matter what you believe. I believe in Jesus, and you can talk me out of it. I said, well, that's very good. But how do you, you see, every day I run into people at work who tell me the exact same thing, who tell me that they, what they believe is good for them, but they're not in Christians. They're Hindus and Muslims and other religions. Or they're into reincarnation or into the crystals. So how do we know who's right? How do we know that, we, that they're wrong? How do we know that we're not wrong? And how do we know that we've not been fooled? And what makes us any better than anybody else who disagrees with us? So, there's no way that we can say that we're right and they're wrong unless we can prove that we're right and that they're wrong. And that's exactly what the Bible says. The Bible says, always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. And this is where we get the word apologetics. And that word, answer, is also, trans it, the word is apologia. It doesn't mean that I apologize. It means I explain or defend. Right? So, back to reincarnation. So this is why we're past this. We have to be able to defend what we believe, if it's true. Now, so reincarnation's origins are in Hinduism. But it's even really that we know of it today. But it really originates in earlier places like the ancient Greek philosophers. The ancient Greek philosophers, and I feel I'm dropping out sometimes, called it metempsychosis, meaning the change of souls. Right? Metempsychosis, the change of souls. So metem is the change, I believe. Yeah, psychosis is the souls. But um, for the Hindu and Buddhist, reincarnation is what we call the law of transmigration, which is based on the law of karma. Right? Now, Americans don't know how to pronounce that. They call it karma, karma, right? It's karma. But this reminds me of a sticker I saw that mocked Christians. It said, my karma ran over your dogma. No, that doesn't sound right. So it's my karma ran over your dogma, right? <laughs> Meaning, I don't care what you believe. <laughs> my karma ran over your dogma. Okay. So, but this is, this is, what is karma? Like, karma is basically a bank balance, right? We've heard about it before. Uh, you build up credits or debits by doing good or bad in this life. Then when you die with a more positive credit or uh, less positive, or if you're over the debit, then you come back to life at a stage higher and better than you were before. So this concept, by the way, is taught in Hindu in the Bhagavad Gita. Bhagwad, Bhagwan is God, Gita is song, so Bhagavad Gita is the song of God. And Krishna is the key character in this book. It's a very short book. You all should read it. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's like, what, 30 pages, 50 pages? It's not very long. And it's a quick read. And it's basically about Krishna, who is the charioteer of um, Arjuna, right? Arjuna, right? The, and, and Arjuna is this prince or king. And he's out to attack. He's in a battle against his cousin to rule the land. And he's having this discussion with Krishna saying, I feel this is wrong. I'm going out to kill my cousins. And Krishna basically explains in the, um, 
in the um, uh, Bhagavad Gita, it says, just as the soul acquires a childhood body, a youth body, an old age body during this life, similarly, the soul acquires another body after death. Just as a person puts on new garments after discarding the old ones, similarly, the living entity of the individual soul acquires new bodies after casting away the old bodies. So the idea of reincarnation is really introduced in the Bhagavad Gita. You don't see it as much in the earlier text, but it's really elaborated in the Bhagavad Gita, right? So, so this whole thing is called the samsara, or the circle of life. Oh, sorry, not that circle of life, this circle of life, right? So in the circle of life, you have... Uh, you have birth, you, you are born, and then you grow old, and you die, and you're born, and you grow old, and you die, and you keep uh, circulating, right? Now, here's what's interesting. In Hinduism, you have something called the caste system. And in the caste system, um, it's basically a grouping of people into elite and not-so-elite classes. If you are a bad person in your past life, you will come back in a lower caste. So if you're, if you're here, and you're a bad, if you're a Vashaya, Vashya, I, I can never pronounce that. The Shastras, the Brahmins, I can probably, but how do you say it, Sajid? Huh? Vashya, right? Vashya, it's the Vashyas. Uh, and then if you're, if you're a, a Vash, Vashya and you're a bad Vashya, you go down into the Shudras. Uh, and if you're even more, you get out of the caste systems and you go into the untouchables, right? And then if you are good, you go, go upwards into the Brahmins and finally you achieve Nirvana at the top the better you are. And it's a, climb, it's a stage you have to climb. As you go through multiple lives, you come back at a higher, higher level or a lower, lower level, right? Now, what's interesting about this is, you notice these are the twice-born groups, because that means they've been born at least a couple of times, right? So if you're very good, so I, my guess is, and I have not been able to finalize, I should ask my dad. My dad's an expert in, in, in Hinduism, but if you're, I think everybody starts, well, there is no everybody now, but maybe originally there was an everybody. But people are start at this point and they go up or down at that point. Okay, so at the top end of the spectrum, you have the Brahmins or the priests, which is where my answer is to come from. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, you have no idea. <laughs> and at the bottom end is you have the untouchables, which is the outer castes, and these are the people usually end up being uh, used to be in the lower income. Now India has a um, what do they call it? a scheduled caste system. So if you're in the lower caste, you're considered, it's like a minority, you get special preferences. And this has resulted in a lot of people being angry at these lower castes because they get all these special preferences. And some of them are really, really rich, and they're still getting these special preferences in the thing. So it's just like a, a quota system that doesn't really work. OK. Um, now, if you were a, a wonderful Brahmin, you keep, keep moving up, and you le reach a level of perfection called the Atman. No, sorry, the Brahman. The Atman is your soul. Uh, the Brahman. And if you uh, achieve that, which was Nirvana, then you actually don't reincarnate anymore, right? What happens is you, you stop reincarnating altogether. You merge into the Godhead and you cease to exist as an independent being, as a soul. Okay? And you're absor absorbed back into the Godhead. And remember the, I don't know, we talked about this briefly when I talked about the different religions. Um, the Godhead of Hinduism, actually, I don't think I meant it, is Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu. And these are the three. So it's actually a trinity, very much similar to Christianity. And remember, I, I pointed how my dad actually has shown that he thinks that Hinduism is a mutation of Christianity. Okay, so Hinduism has no heaven. Notice that? So you go all the way up, and then you get absorbed into the Brahman. And, and where have you heard that line before? Imagine there is no heaven. Where do you think he got it from? Right? So kids, John Lennon sang a song, Imagine There's No Heaven. It's easy if you try. And he spent a lot of time under this, uh, this yogi. I can't remember his name. but There you go, Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. All right. Pardon? Yeah, those are the Beatles. Yeah, for the people who don't know, yeah. Oh, yes, really? At the same time? Wow, okay. Yeah, transcendence. So this is where, so a lot of that comes to America as the New Age movement, and we'll, do, we'll talk about it, right? So, and, um, so this, this also explains why Hindus, or strict Hindus, won't eat meat. Right? Because it's, you're killing a soul if you eat a cow or an animal. That is a soul that is transmigrated into another animal. So they, they, were, they went down. So that kind of explains that. Now, it, Hinduism, though, is not monolithic. In fact, 
it will tell you that. You can go to uh, Bengal and they eat fish. You go to the central parts of India, they won't eat any meat. And then if you go actually to northern India, there's actually a place where they sacrifice animals too. So it's, it's not a cohesive, there are many different variations of it. And the Kashmir, yeah, and the Kashmir, I didn't know that, that's good to know. <laughs> yeah. Now what's interesting is I had a friend here once who was from India, very strict, devout uh, Hindu, and he said, and, and he was like, let's go get a burger. I'm like, dude, you're Hindu. <laughs> he goes, no, 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 but this is an American cow. <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't eat an Indian cow, I'll eat an American cow. I'm like, uh, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. If that makes him go down. Like, it depends again which part of Hinduism, because remember, Hinduism is not monolithic. You can, as I said, you know, there's so many, and, and that's why you, uh, we'll, if we ever do a class just on purely Hinduism, I'll go into all the different parts. If it's actually a combination of different um, animistic uh, uh, tribes and stuff. Okay. So in Hinduism, there isn't, but there is, an, in fact, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, let me explain the next slide. She says, it's a good thing you don't um, uh, reincarnate as a plant, right? So um, now when Hinduism came to America is the, as a New Age movement, Maharishi Yogi, and as a, um, uh, there was a guy who went to the, yeah, Rajneesh, well, everybody, yeah, yeah or in Oregon, right? So Rajneesh was in Oregon, but before that, there was a guy who came to the American Congress. Vivekanand, yeah. So he came in, he comes here, and then, but, but then the, it, Hinduism comes, but Hinduism has some unpalatable things that you could reincarnate as an animal or something like that. So the New Age movement kind of changed it. So the original reincarnation equal transmigration, so you could come back as an animal or a human, or in Sikhism or Jainism, you can come back as a plant. Now, Jainism is very interesting. So Jainism, what they believe is because you, a plant could have a soul, you should never eat a plant with, that you destroy the roots. So you can only eat a plant where the plant is not destroyed in the eating. Now, this is interesting, though, because there are different, yeah. So, but in Jainism, they're not allowed to eat. Oh, is that it? Because, yeah, yeah. They wear a mask for, yeah. So they were doing masks before we were doing masks. Yeah, root. So they don't do root vegetables. They don't do. Okay. Because the one, the, the thing I was reading said, and maybe it was, might have been an Americanized version of it, it was like, you know, you shouldn't, because you're killing the plant kind of thing. You should only eat the fallen fruits. You don't pick the fruit. You only eat foreign fruits. I'm like, well, what about wheat and rice? Well, Jainism is actually predates uh, Hinduism. It's, it's ancient, so. So they, they adapt. They, they adapt. I mean, the, again, so you have to understand that a lot of a lot of my Hindu so uh, some a lot of my Hindu friends you should understand a lot of my Hindu friends are Hindu by tradition, not by belief, right? So they uh, they they're like this is what we do. Like I have a friend that I always have arguments with, and he doesn't eat meat, but I'm like, dude, you're not even a Hindu because like because I don't like the taste of meat. <laughs> He, he's like an atheist, pretty much, but he doesn't eat meat. I'm like, what's going on? He goes, hey, I, I grew up like this. I don't like the taste of meat, right? So people are cult a lot of my friends are culturally Hindu. Yes, yeah, so there are, the, no, not here, but in, uh, in most part of parts of India, you cannot eat beef because the people, the local people will come up and burn, burn your house down. But in South India, you can because there are more Muslims than Christians. So it really depends. But there are some parts of India you will you'll see cows, but you'll never you can never slaughter them. Right? Yeah. So how come the places? So how come the one place where like they have the best meat curries and stuff, they can't even eat them? 
Well, no, but that's because you think of South India <laughs> okay. parts of India. So South India is great for, in fact, Sajit and I went to a great, yeah, yeah, we're from Kerala state. So they couldn't ban beef. Yeah. So and you can travel over Kerala and have very tasty beef. Yeah. And know. it's a it's a problem because here in America, very few Indian restaurants will at least I shouldn't say in America, in, in San Jose, because I've had beef in Indian restaurants in Nevada. But in San Jose it's very hard to find an Indian restaurant beef unless it's a South Indian restaurant. Right? Surrounded by by uh, three three states surrounding New Delhi. New Delhi, no no uh, no meat, and the two other states no meat, but the third state next to New Delhi that they could they could they, uh, yeah. they could uh, butcher beef and what they'd cut it all up, throw it on a bicycle, and bring it into town every every day. So you couldn't kill it there, but you could bring it yeah. there and sell and, it and there, and eat these, it there. So so now remember, this is the exception for beef, but a lot of times you'll get chicken and mutton and, yeah. and lamb. Right. So, okay, let's keep going. So now, in the new age, most of the new age folks did not like this idea of coming back as an animal. So in the new age reincarnation, it's you only come back as a human. Right? Right, Marcy? <laughs> no, it's, it's adopted from America. Marcy and Monty uh, were in the new age movement before they got saved, so they can talk about this. Okay, so... Um, so here's a movie star for the younger kids. Her name was Shirley MacLaine. Uh, she was really into this whole thing. And, and she says in her biography, autobiography, um, that was or written by somebody, she says, or I think it was a biography, not an autobiography. She says, uh, the guy says, at various times she has insisted her many paths have included lives as a medieval warrior, an orphan raised by elephants, a Japanese geisha, and a model for post-impressionist painter Tulu Latre. Even her beloved pet terri rat terrier, Terry, is McLean's convinced a reincarnation of the jackal-headed Egyptian god, Anubis. You know? Yeah, how, come, <laughs> how come none of them have, you know, there, there are all these things like, oh yeah, I, used to, I was reincarnated from Egyptian princess. Well, how many, how many were you, how, why don't we get more Egyptian slaves? How many, how many Egyptian princesses were there, is the question I ask. Uh, how was her box office movies doing at the time? I don't think they were doing that well because she was kind it's of kind of like prime. you'll see a lot of celebrities all of a yeah. sudden they're starting to lose plop popularity and all of a sudden they're different genders yeah or they can true. talk to ghosts yeah they want to yeah because now if you don't hire them then you're a transphobe right so uh so at that time this cartoon came out there it is again a feeling that in the past life I was someone named Shirley MacLaine okay so I want to get the difference between Hindu reincarnation and Buddhist reincarnation, because there is a, a significant difference. So, the Hindu doctrine of reward and punishment for previous life's acts provide many ways of attaining moksha, or self-realization. Your soul comes back in a new body, but once you attain nirvana, you're done and cease to exist as you. So as long as you're recycling before you hit the pinnacle, you come back as you, right? Now, the Buddhist concept is slightly different. Um, Buddhist teaches that the state of existence for living beings occurs again and again, that is, rebirth follows the laws of cause and effect. And this happens because circumstances conducive to birth arise again and again. So even if you reach nirvana, you could re-exist. But it's not really the you that was before. It's the clone of your soul in a new body, thus the Dalai Lama or the Panchen Lama, right? In other words, it's not really you. It's a clone of you. In Hinduism, it really is you coming back in a different body. I just want to add something. Give him the mic, yeah. Sajid is the other resident expert because he grew up in. Neil's <laughs> dad, I have read his Neil's dad's book. It's it's excellent. It's it's very detailed uh, on Hinduism. But the difference, right, is actually more fundamental than what you're describing Please, here. Yeah. Because in Buddhism, there really is no concept of God. Yeah. It's an. However, the concept of nirvana was actually unique to Buddhism, and it really means. The seizing of, uh, they, actually, they actually call it uh, cessation, meaning, and the Buddha, when asked what it was, he said he didn't know, really. That, and, and that, but you'll know when you But it's there. like, uh, you, seize, you seize rebirth, right? Your consciousness, everything just disappears. Whereas in, in Hinduism, it's like you referred to earlier, when you reach perfection, that soul, 
unites with, with God with and Brahman, that, and yeah. really they believe in only one God which yeah. they refer to as Brahman Brahman and, and the other Brahma Shiva, Shiva. you know whereas Atman is meant to be your soul just, just right separate. but when you cease to have any karma left is you're totally purified you reach union with God and there's no more Atman or whatever everything yeah, is just then, Brahman then you, you, yeah yeah and so that's the difference but for Hindus there's a strong belief in that one God Right. In in Buddhism there is no, not. So Buddhism yeah. is basically, yeah, and we talk we talked about it briefly. Yeah, Buddhism is basically atheism. There is no God. There's a, it's not a known. Uh, more accurately, it's agnosticism in the sense that if you actually look at the Buddha's actual words when pressed, he said he really couldn't talk about it. He he really didn't know. Yeah, yeah. But and so to clarify, the secession means in in Buddhism is you cease wanting. And so you're at peace in a sense, because one of the tenets of Buddhism is the reason that you strife and you have pain is because you desire. And when you get to that point where you are at equilibrium, you need nothing, you want nothing, and that's when you achieve nirvana, you're at peace, right? So, and then if you die at that point, then, but again, the, you could re, reincarnate, not because it's you reincarnating, but because the time and the place required a person like you again. And thus, you get the Panchen Lama and all those. Yeah, you go. In these phases, is there a concept of a final humanity ending battle, say, like Armageddon for the Christianity? I uh, don't the think, faith? in Hinduism, there's an idea of a reestablishment of the, of the universe every so often or something like that. But it's, a, it's not a well often taught one. So no, there isn't like an Armageddon in Hinduism. There is in Islam. When the tenth Mahadi shows up, tenth or eleventh Mahadi shows up, yeah. I, I've had a question about Buddhism. I read the origin of Buddhism and how um, the leader of Buddhism who wrote the precepts, Siddhartha. Yeah, yeah, didn't he credit God as giving him that revelation? Not that I know of. No, because uh, I looked it up in the encyclopedia and it said. He he had felt that God had given him the revelation or, or something. And so there is so there there are two branches of a Buddhism. One is the more Hinduistic branch, and that's what it came to India, and it kind of and that actually is more theistic. And then there's the original Buddhism, which is what we think is more pure, and that tends to be more atheistic or Gnostic or. And that's it's the, the thing that I thing. was it's wondering. Star is, Wars. They seem to have cut this out. I mean, I think it'd be really interesting to study that man's life in a way because it's almost like that got cut out of it, that it was a revelation from God. Somehow that's just, just yeah, left see, out Yeah, I would argue that it was added and not taken out. You think that was added or taken the, away? The, the God part was added into it, I think, more. Yeah. Like, Sajid can... The elements, all the elements of what he was teaching were not original, that he had learnt it from other earlier spiritual teachers. That's, those were the Buddha's own words. That, Other Buddhas. And he basically. was a person who synthesized many things and made it like a coherent, coherent teaching. It was unique in that synthesis. That, that's really what it was. But he, um, he never said something like it was a revelation from S God. That, if you have that link, send it to me. I'd be very interested. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's possible. That it's Cutting off so yeah, it's possible that's there, but I tend to be biased towards it was added and not subtracted. Yeah, it's interesting. So, okay, I mean, at least from everything I know about Buddha and his teachings. Right? Okay, so let's talk about monism. Monism is the belief that ultimately everything in the universe is one. We're all one with God, one with our fellow man, one with the animals, one with the earth, right? Um, it's the belief that Everything is, and this is related to pantheism, and that pantheism is God is the unseen force in the universe that binds everything together. Right? So you see this all in Star Wars, the whole concept of the force and all that, and you see a lot of that. And where have we heard this one? We are one with God, one with our fellow man, one with the animals. This guy. I am he, as you are he, as you are me, and we are all together. Right? Now some people say he was just fooling around, because this whole song is kind of a nonsense song. But, you know, it's, I am, and, and it goes the next line, I'm the warless cuckoo to goochie, right? <laughs> I am the egg man, right? He goes into a whole bunch of stuff like that. But, uh, but again, if you think about this and you tie it back to this monism or Hinduism, it really is, right? So, 
So the idea is that we are all, and there is a, actually there's a, there's a story, I can't remember who wrote it, but there's an idea of this concept that there is only one soul. And we are all reincarnations of that soul over and over and over again. Pardon? Yeah, but we're just reincarnation of the one soul again and again and again, except we never remember that. So when we hurt somebody, we're actually hurting ourselves in a previous life. So now we're all, you're part of me from a, from a life that I don't remember. So th- I, that's not a religion. It's just a theory that people have thrown out there, which, of course, has no sound for it. <laughs> Why would you kill yourself, right? Yeah, it is. It is. It's kind of, yeah. Hinduism, does, does it ever end? I mean, are you just going to keep... Well, so in Hinduism, once you, you reach, once you reach uh, nirvana, or once you reach, once once your karma is zero, then you can achieve. Uh, you you get merged in with uh, the Brahman. Yeah. Well, how many times does it take to get there? As, depending how bad you are. If you're good, it could be just a few times. But if you, huh? Yeah, a few more times. <laughs> For you, it's only you'll be done in this life. Of course. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, back there. Sandy has a question. <laughs> yeah, that's a good pickup line. I better, I better get to take you out because you're not going to reincarnate again. You're so perfect. <laughs> you're like, what? <laughs> so what are the ways in which um, you can, in those kind of conceptions, um, build your positive karma? What are their conceptions of good, virtue? So there are many good deeds. There are good deeds you can do. You can give to the poor. You can, uh, you know, not lie, not cheat. There's, you know, there's a whole bunch of things you can do, right? Is it it's many, very simple. It's similar to just a moral law, right? So do they have a strong emphasis on love? Yeah, I would say okay. so, yeah. Um, but, but there is a higher emphasis and that is doing puja to the gods. So in other words, if you meditate on, the God, on God's word, if you do... If you worship him, if you so there's a there's a level of uh, saints, sannyasis who sannyasis who get there by um, uh, by basically meditating on God's word and then they become ascended masters, so to speak. I see. That's the American word. So is there an equivalent to like the Buddha in Hinduism? Yeah, okay. it would be very similar. Who is that person? Oh, you mean oh a person? Sorry, yeah. no, not really a person. About the positive things, like so, if you go to Borobudur in Indonesia, uh, it's a World Heritage site, and you can see all the parables of the Buddha. Just like there were Jesus parables, there were stories of Buddha's various lives, and you can see the carvings, and it'll tell you stories of like there was a hungry tiger uh, apparently that was so hungry it started feasting on its cub, and the Buddha came across that hungry tiger in one of his lives and he um, felt so much compassion that he gave his life to the hungry tigress. He, he let the, the tigress have him for the meal so that it wouldn't uh, eat her cub. I mean, these are the stories. I mean, it, it meant to illustrate one of the teachings in Buddhism is actually the perfection of charity, like generosity. So, so there's the Eightfold Path. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, the eightfold path, but there's a sixth perfection. Yeah, like yeah, 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 yeah. And the first yeah, one. We didn't talk about. We we talk about the eightfold path. Yeah. yeah, charity. So they they teach charity. Like the more charity you do, it's more positive karma yeah. that you that you reap. So so it's basically a, there's a moral law. The only difference is it's very similar in the sense of Christianity too. Okay. They don't have like the sixth perfection. Yeah, eightfold. So then, how do you perform? How do you ascend? in virtue in Hinduism? It's, well, it's, so... But, I mean, we have, you know, you do puja, it, you, you meditate. Yeah, and, I mean, so the genesis of Hinduism was really, like, there's version one, which was all animal sacrifice, and, you know, if you sacrifice animals, you're going to become wealthy, and that was very, very old. The much later, what you see today in the world is version two. Your dad yeah, knows all yeah. this, right? It's version two where they learned from all the other religions and they modify the whole bunch well, of stories. Well, the thing about Hinduism is constantly changing and mutating, yeah, it's so adapting. It's, it's, it's kind of a lot 
yeah. Oh, Hugo, Sandy and then Hugo, if you got a question. Very quick follow-up. So did you um, find that there's a lot of uh, corroboration of, say, the perennial philosophy, some sort of universal um, set of virtues that is practiced through many religions and philosophies around the world? Yeah, so there, so, okay, so the, we have to be careful when we say that. Yeah, there is the, the if you think of the, the do unto others as you would like done to you, and the negative Jesus is don't do unto others that you don't want done to you. Uh, so that is in all the philosophies. The Hammurabi Code is pretty much, and this is the argument I have with atheists. Atheists will say, well, I don't need to know I shouldn't be killing and raping people. I said, yeah, you don't, you don't need the Bible to, you know, they'll say, I don't need your Bible to know, because that's pretty universal. I said, yeah, but you do need the Bible to know that you shouldn't have slavery. You shouldn't have child prostitution. <laughs> you shouldn't sacrifice children. They go like, so yeah, absolutely you do, because the only reason those laws were created or banned were politically. Now, in some cases, cases, a lot of times these are, uh, they're directly from the Bible, right? So, because the, nobody thought slavery was bad throughout history until the Christians showed up, right? That too, it wasn't until 1600 years later, 1600 years later, yeah. Okay, so there's uh, this karma, you can go up and down yeah. on your next life. Say someone took a jab because they believe the media and the government, and then, you know, they bleed to death, they die. So the next life, is that going to be up or down? Well, it depends how good they were scale? in that life before, right? <laughs> so the current life, just because they took a jab and they died. Well, that, the jab is not a moral issue, right? And it depends on where they were, because you could do good things and bad things, and you know. So it really depends on that scale of power of of deeds, right? Factor. I get. We should get going because others will never get through. But I want to hear. I just wanted to say real quick is um, thank the Lord that He um, revealed Himself to us and we got out of the New Age movement. But when we're in it, that something that is so um, consistent throughout false teaching is that. Um, you can sprinkle in a little scripture here and there, and everything is by works. And in contrast, that we we have the Bible and it's entire. We don't add or take away. And the scripture does teach that we live once and die once, and then we face the judgment. It's very clear on that. But I was going to say that when we were in the New Age movement, everything costs money. I mean, like. You can come here and listen to Neil, and you don't have to pay anything. If you want to give, you give. If you go to church on Sunday, you don't have to pay anything. But in the New Age movement, everything had a price. And you could actually go and have a past life regression, and they put it all on a cassette tape so that you can remember who you were in the past lives and stuff. And I remember we did that a few times. I mean, it was so stupid. <laughs> Were you, we were you a it. princess in the past life? I was something great. I don't remember <laughs> what it was, but you were never a street person or just a housewife or anything. You're like always that. a hero, but you were never always. Just a... But anyway, um, yeah, it's so real, and people really believe that stuff today. And they made money on it. And people who are hey, Christians come come make next week. We'll commitment. charge you hundred bucks each, and we'll <laughs> back there, and then we'll let's move ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I want to get to the meat. We're just giving you the background okay, information here. Good, yeah. good. So, so just a quick question. So you say that um, where you move up or down depends on your works. Yeah. What, would it be possible for a child who has passed away to reincarnate? Yeah, of course. But, but, if, but, but if they, they would be at the had... level, they would be probably at the same level then, right? Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. So, of course, Christianity is not based on that because Christianity says there's nothing you can do to save yourself, right? And Christianity is based on you have a personal relationship with Christ and it's a forgiveness of your sins. So you're not, you can't do something to, to be forgiven your sins. You have to really want your sins to be forgiven. You have to regret what you've done. You've got to ask, you have to repent. So you have to repentance and forgiveness. And then you get, I'm sorry, repentance and atonement and then you have forgiveness and atonement is done by Christ. So you don't have to do any of the work yourself. Now, the good thing about it is it, re it reduces corruption because you can't do a bad thing and then make up for it by doing a good thing. So that's the good thing about it. The bad thing is people might say, oh, I'm forgiven by Christ and do this. This is called, no, there's a word, uh, nominism or something. I can't remember the word for it now. I just, but, um, but those people aren't saved. They're not Gnostic. There's a, there's a, yeah, right here. Generally speaking, 
um, we were just talking about a child passing away or, or a child, a, a, a new birth in the family. And, you know, you have a grandmother, grandfather, and the child starts exhibiting characteristics like the grandparents did. And they go, oh, look, they're just like grandpa, like grandparents, grandma, grandpa still alive. They don't think much of it. <clears throat> but grandma and grandpa just died and the baby's born. Right. And it, the, the kid grows up and starts having some characteristics that were right. indicative of the grandparents. And then they say, oh, look, it's just like them. I wonder if, I wonder if. I said, so what's the difference? The thing is, is that we always look for similarities. We right. always are Although, looking, yeah. or we're always identifying characteristics and 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 uh, 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 personality traits that that people exhibit, and we 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 try to categorize them. We always categorize them with somebody we used to know or whatever, and we that leads to people thinking that's what we yeah. So, but but now wait for the evidence, though. So. So, okay, so let's, uh, I want to talk about the top 10. Now, when I did this, uh, David Letterman was very famous, and he used to do a top 10. So this is the top 10 advantages of reincarnation, right? Number 10, you can apply to any problem and produce an explanation, right? This guy was bad, this guy was good, uh, he reincarnated, you know, he's got bad karma, whatever, right? So you can, you know, this, this, this person looks like that person, I have a memory for deja vu, all this, right? So uh, number nine, you get lots of second chances if you mess up, right? That's the advantage of, well, on this life, okay, fine. I'll, have, I'll be a hedonist on this life, but I'll come back and next life I'll fix it, right? Um, you live forever and ever and ever and ever again and again and again, right? It's eternal life in a sense, because if you don't ever achieve nirvana, then you can keep living forever, right? It's an eternal life as long as you're not stupid enough if you think about it to, to be zero karma, right? Okay. Uh, it solves the age-old problem of why a god would let people starve to death or why a young child would be born paralyzed. Why do bad things happen to good people? It definitely solves the evil and God problem. Now, we went through and we, solved, we told you why the evil and God problem was not an evil and God problem, right? It was a completely different issue. But this kind of gives you the answer. That, well, why did that child die? Oh, because they had bad karma um, in their past life or whatever, right? They're just paying it off. Okay, uh, salvation is totally dependent on the individual. You decide, you decide. You decide if you go up or down, right? You, it's up to you. It's completely up to you, nobody else, right? Number five, God is not a cruel God and will never send, never damn someone to hell. There is no evil God in this process. You get what you deserve. <clears throat> Number four, the soul is immortal, right? So it's very Christian in that sense. Number three, man is basically good and will he work his way back to Brahman, right? which is God. There is no absolute good or absolute bad, only absolute vodka. Everything is relative. <laughs> right? I mean, if you think about it, it's great because, you know, oh yeah, you're doing this. It's not absolutely good. It's bad. You're just a bad. You had bad karma. This happened to you. And, and in a sense, you could excuse bad things happening to bad people like, well, I was brought here to give him the punishment for his bad karma, like his past life. You know? If I'm not a slave master, how will he pay for his his past life and, and earn better deeds, right? And finally, number one, good begets good and evil begets evil. No good goes on reward and no evil goes on punished. So people feel that the morality is equalized, right? It, it, it's, it's a just system. You can't complain. It's a just system, right? So these are the reasons why people like it. And there's now, but there is a 10th one, or 11th one, the top 11 advantages is now all religions just become different pathways to God, be it Islam, Hinduism, Shamanism, Mormonism. We can all be open-minded. You didn't get that. I'll read that again. Shamanism, Mormonism, <laughs> etc. We can all be open-minded. This way we can embrace not only these new open religions, but also the religion of ancestors, Christianity. So it's like we can merge everything together and have this happy, one big happy family. Right. So now let's go into the case of reincarnation. Um, so all this is very useless unless we can actually show that reincarnation happened or takes place. So here's a, a, a gal. This is the case of Rina Gupta. And Professor Hamanad, Hamad Dharanath and I'm, uh, uh, Banerjee investigated the case of a young girl who at the age of two began to speak about my husband. He's a very bad man. He killed me. I have a hole in my stomach. This, for some reason, disturbed her parents, I wonder why, uh, to no end. <laughs> they thought she was fantasizing. She was able to describe in great detail the details of her past life. She knew about the events of her previous life. 
She claimed that she'd been murdered by a husband in a town which she named. It was a town far away. She knew in detail, in detailed events of the slain woman's domestic life that only a dead woman, the dead woman herself or her closest relatives would have known. Said the professor, investigating it, rarely in the history of her reincarnation has there been anything to equal this incredible case. In June of 1961, a 20-year, eight-year-old woman named Gurdip Singh was fatally stabbed in her stomach by her husband, Sarjit Singh. He was incarcerated for 10 years in the state prison for murder. Seems like a light sentence. Uh, the first sign that the slain woman had come to life se came seven years later when the young girl, Rina Gupta, startled her parents with a statement about her husband and her murder. He insisted that she had four children and gave them gave their nicknames. She stated that her husband in her former life had hurt his leg starting a motor scooter and at one time became enraged when she tried on one of his sweaters. She, on May 27, 1968, most of the murdered woman's children and family came to visit this girl. She was then three years old. What happened then was incredible. When the family entered the room, her face lit up immediately, and she recognized and named the children and other members of the family. She then traveled with the family to their town, and she identified their home, a picture of herself in her former life, identified all the things connected to herself that only the woman or those people themselves could have known, yet they lived hundreds of miles apart, and the families never knew each other. Two days after that, little Rina went to visit the parents of the slain woman, Gurdip Singh. She recognized the inside of the house, and that's when I knew our daughter had been reborn in this child's body, says her father, or in the private life. Now, the most astonishing thing happened three years later in 1971, 10 years after the murder. What happened 10 years after the murder? The murderer was let out of prison. When the dead woman's husband, Sarjit Singh, was released from prison where he'd been serving time for murder, he heard about Rina, and he was overcome by curiosity. He came to her house posing as a man who wanted to do business with Rina's father. The child was then six years old, and she became terrified immediately, and she said, he is not who he says he is. He is my husband, Surjit. He has come to kill me again. Make him go away. And here is a picture of her. And she refused. She didn't want to get any closer to him. They forced her to sit next to him, just for the picture. And you can see that she's like, I don't want to be here. The stunned Sarjeet confessed who he was and went away, but not before photographs had been taken of both the man and the little girl who claimed that she was Sarjeet. Does it give you chills? <laughs> 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 Professor Banji of the Indian Institute of Parapsychology spent six months of intense study with both families, validating the facts, asking them complex, strict questions to detect any fraud. At the conclusion of the study, Banji stated that he was convinced between, beyond a shadow of doubt that this was a genuine case of reincarnation. Rina Gupta really was Surjit Singh, reborn. A couple more, right? Uh, actually, before I go to that, let me give you a couple more cases. Uh, April 1950, a boy of 10 named Nirmal died in a, of smallpox in Kosi Kalan in the state of Uttar Pradesh in India. Uttar Pradesh is famous now because they gave everybody ivermectin during the COVID thing and their death rate went down to 10. <laughs> while the rest of the state over them had thousands of dead. Okay, um, in Uttar Pradesh, uh, in, this, uh, in August of 1951, a boy who was named Prakash, so the first boy was named Nirmal, he died of smallpox in Kozikalan. In August 1951, a year later, a boy who was named Prakash was born to another family in the town of Chata, six miles away. At the age of four, Prakash began to tell his parents he belonged in Kozikalan, Kalan, not here. He claimed that his name really was Nirmal. In 1961, the father and sister of Nirmal, the dead boy, having heard of Prakash, visited the boy. He immediately recognized them both. And later, when he visited the house of Nirmal, he recognized the place as well, of, as, well as identifying other relatives. Not surprisingly, Nirmal's parents became convinced of their dead son and became that had been reborn as Prakash. Happens in Lebanon, too. Imad Elawar was born on December 21st, 1958, in Konayel, 15 miles, east of, 15 miles east of Beirut, Lebanon. When Imad was less than two years old, he began to talk about his previous life. He grew more articulate. He claimed to have lived in the village of Kirby, about 20 miles southeast of Beirut, with the Busami family, B Busahamazi family. 
He mentioned names of the people and events familiar to him. And then in 1963, Imad's father and uncle traveled to Kirby and were able to confirm the accuracy of some of the names. Imad's remarks became more and more startling and specific. He named a woman named Jamil and expressed that he was glad he was able to walk again as though he'd been lame in his previous life. His father started researching the matter. So he's, he's talking to this lady and he says, his father started researching the matter and found that in the town of Kirby there had lived a man by the name of Ibrahim Bohamas that had a mistress named Jamil and he died of spinal tuberclo tuberculosis tuberculosis on September 18, 1949. The disease had killed, that had killed him had caused him a lot of difficulty in walking and rendered him bedridden for the last two months of his life. Okay, so this is basically, and there's books and books of this, right? There's a whole book of that called Children and, uh, Children's Previous Lives or stuff like that. So now, so we've, we've studied the historical evidence of the Bible, right? And so I'm not going to go over why we think the Bible is the Word of God and why we think it's proven, right? So that's all. We've done videos on that. We have all that. So we're going to move on for that. We're, we've, we've, we've done the whole series where we prove God exists using science. We prove the Bible is accurate. We prove Jesus really rose from the dead, right? We've proved all that stuff. And now, so I'm not going to go back over that, although I will cover one more thing uh, that we covered once before. So <clears throat> most New World Reincarnation believers are also convinced that the Bible teaches reincarnation, right? You saw the verses, right? Here's a book here by Elizabeth Clare Prophet. She says, here's, she's, um, this is a French website, not connected to Elizabeth Clare Prophet. And she says that reincarnation, says reincarnation and religion. Since the beginning of all religions, reincarnation has been considered as an alternative to death. In the gospel, Christ used references to past life many times. He says, I tell you the truth, from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcibly advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John, and if you're willing to accept it, he is Elijah who was to come. He is who hears to hear, let him hear. So she says, hey, Jesus said that John the Baptist was Elijah reincarnated, right? And then Matthew 17, and his disciples asked him, saying, why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? He answers and said, Elijah is coming and restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came and did not recognize him, but he did this, did to him whatsoever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer their hands. And then the disciples understood he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. So Jesus himself supposedly said, John the Baptist was a reincarnation. Of the of John the Baptist, sorry of Elijah, okay, and then uh, they go on to say, and in reply, Jesus declared, "I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again and again and again." Implied again and again, and you had that in the in the discussion time about a born a blind person. Jesus, who had never asked the reason for his blindness, says, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but implied he sinned in a previous existence, right? Okay, then she says this. <clears throat> Let's keep in mind that until the year 553 of our era, reincarnation was part of the Christian religion. But it had been put aside after the Constantinople Council simply because, as the rumor says, the concept of reincarnation bothered the Empress Theodora, who had a lot to blame herself of. And she didn't want to accept that she could have been an inferior rank in a future life. Or she could be of an inferior rank in a future life. So this belief has been banned, but not totally forbidden. It has never been declared anathema. Anathema means of the, basically of the devil. It's completely damned. Okay. <clears throat> and then, of course, uh, reincarnation about for whatever a man sows, this he will also reap in the next life. Hebrews 7.19. And didn't Paul say that Jesus was a reincarnation of Melchizedek? Right? So you see all these verses. So let's refute the claims. These are the claims. John the Baptist, the reincarnation of Elijah. B, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. A blind man sinned in previous existence. Reincarnation was part of Christianity before AD 553. What a man sows, he'll reap in the next life. And then Jesus is the reincarnation of Melchizedek. You have 10 minutes to refute that. Each of you, no. So uh, let's see, what time is it? Yeah, we should get going. Usually what we do is we, this time we stop and I give you each group, I give you one verse and you have to disprove it. So I'll just go through it because we, we started late and, and we had a lot of Q&A in between. So 
Let's go through it right away. So here's a creep game. Whoop! What happened? Fell out of my pocket. <clears throat> okay, so here is the proof, the refutation. One, let me assure you, reincarnation is not supported in the Bible. Uh, when you're arguing this, and if you argue with someone, with, um, with uh, Robin, if you run into these guys and you're arguing with them, don't argue one or two points that they give you because they're going to take verses out of context. Um, a good friend of mine named Greg Kokel says, never read a single Bible verse. His idea is you always read it in context. You read five or ten of them. Never read just one. You can memorize one, but never read just one, right? So you have to take the whole thing in context. So let's look at the first thing. Okay, claim A, the, <clears throat> the transfiguration, right? Uh, was, John, was John the Baptist, Elijah, reincarnated? Well, first of all, remember the transfiguration. When did it happen? Before John was a... a so just so for Sajid who doesn't know that. So John the Baptist was the prophet sent to declare the way of... of this was the last prophet sent to declare that Jesus was coming, to prepare the way of the Lord. He gets Herod really mad at him, and Herod chops his head off, right? Because he didn't want to get involved in politics. John would never say anything bad about the king. No, he did. He got involved in politics, got his head chopped off for it, right? And uh, Jesus said John the Baptist was, referred to him as though he was Elijah come back. And then after John the Baptist is dead, Jesus shows up with Elijah and Moses in what we call the transfiguration. He actually sees, they, the, the apostles see Elijah there, and they see uh, Moses there, and they're talking to Jesus, right? So they actually see that. And So the question is, when did that happen? Well, the transfiguration happened when? After Elijah, uh, sorry, after John the Baptist was dead, right? So here's the problem. If Elijah is the reincarnation, sorry, if John the Baptist is the reincarnation of Elijah, how did Elijah come back? You can't go back to an old body. Right? You can go back to a new body, but there's nothing that says in, in, you can go back to an old body. Like, so it's not like you, and then you incarnate somebody else, and then you come back to your old body. That's not allowed in reincarnation. It might be allowed in the new age, which is what she is, but it's not allowed in reincarnation. Right? Now, here's the other thing. How did Elijah die? <laughs> he never died, right? And they were going along. So this is, again, in the Old Testament. Elijah was a prophet. And he actually, they were going along talking. Behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire which separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by whirlwind to heaven. So Elijah never died. So you have to die to reincarnate. So this actually makes no sense. Now let's ask if, um, <clears throat> when they went to John the Baptist and they said, are you Elijah, right? Now this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. Now, because remember, Jesus had said this thing that the Baptist, you know, he says, he did not fail to confess, but confess freely, I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He said, no, meaning the prophet Elijah. He said, finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say for yourself? And then he says, I am the voice crying out in the wilderness. Right? Okay. <clears throat> so, oh, yeah, I have it. Jesus replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, I am the voice of one calling out in the desert. Make straight the way of the Lord. Now some Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, why then do you baptize if you're not Christ nor Elijah or the prophet? He says, I baptize with water, John replied, but amongst you stands one who you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the thongs of his sandals I'm not worthy to not untie. And that is Jesus he's talking about. Okay, <clears throat> so John claims he's not. <clears throat> the, the, so what Jesus meant was that John the Baptist was fulfilling the role of Elijah the prophet, not that he was Elijah the prophet. Okay. Now, what about this verse? Claim B. Claim B is <clears throat> that um, nobody can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again and again and again, right? So it says, in reply, so again, read it in context, right? In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he's born again. How can a man be born when he's old? Nicodemus could even say, surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born of the water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. So what is the second birth in Christianity? Is it flesh? It's spirit, right? So you're not born again in a new body. You're born again in the spirit. Now, here's the other thing. If the Jews already believed in reincarnation, 
I mean, the Christians would have adopted it. Then when uh, Nicodemus, Nicodemus would have not said, oh, how could you be born again? He would have said, oh, yeah, I know that. Yeah, we all reincarnate. He didn't say that. He says, are you crazy? You can't be born again. This is a concept that the Jews even thought about. Right? And then, of course, John 3.16, Jesus continues, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son. So you can see there's nothing about reincarnation. Salvation comes through believing in Christ. And that's the only reason. And that's not what reincarnation is. Let's go quickly. Um, as he went along, he saw a blind man. Remember, he says, his disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? That is, he was born blind. And Jesus said, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but this happened so that the work of God may be displayed in his life. So it's got nothing to do with his past life. It's got to do with working the work of God. So he said, he didn't deserve this. God, Jesus very clearly says, the man didn't sin ever, before or now. So it's not karma, right? Okay. Uh, next one. Let's keep in mind until the year 553, right? Okay, so the idea is that before 553, the Gospels all had reincarnation. After 553, the Gospels don't have reincarnation because Constantinople pulled it out. Well, first of all, Constantinople, the Council of Constantinople was back in the 300s. <laughs> so this is like 200 years later. And second, remember when we went through the documents of the Bible? We said we have all these documents and manuscripts dating from as early as 25 years after the books were written, back in, in the 100 AD time frame, all the way to like 600 AD. And what is amazing about all these documents? That they match. <laughs> so where are those 553 earlier documents when we have documents from 300 AD, we have documents from 200 AD, we have documents from 100 AD, and they still match, and none of them have reincarnation in it. So this thing is just goes completely not, oh, what? and I say, we have the ancient Bible manuscripts that date back before AD 53, and they match the manuscripts that date after AD 50, 553, and there's nothing about reincarnation. Okay, Galatians, do not be deceived. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction, the one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap what? Eternal life. Anything about reincarnation in this verse? Again, remember, they take it out of context, and that's how they get there. Okay, let's keep going. Melchizedek. Remember, he says, well, Jesus said that, uh, uh, Paul says Jesus is the reincarnation of Melchizedek. What does he say? Where Jesus, who went before us, has entered on our behalf, he has become a high priest forever in the what? Order of Melchizedek. He does not say Jesus is Melchizedek. Okay. And then the whole thing has to end with this one verse. And I'm taking it out of context because you, you can see so far the context is right. What? It's given for a man to die once and then the judgment. So the Bible basically says, no, there is no reincarnation. And if you go further, now I had somebody say, well, this is given to man to die once per lifetime. Like, how can you die twice per lifetime? <laughs> so it didn't make sense. But here's the reality. is For Christ did not enter a man-made sanctuary that was only a copy of the true one. He entered heaven itself now to appear for us in God's presence. Nor did he enter heaven to offer himself again and again, like in reincarnation, the way the high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood that is not his own. Then Christ would have had to suffer many times since the creation of the world, but now he has appeared once for all to end the end of the ages to do away with sin by sacrifice of itself. What's the thing? Just as man is, this is the context, right? Just as man is destined to die once, and after that the face sacrifice, Christ was sacrificed once to take away the, the, the sins of, all, of many people, and he would appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. Nothing about reincarnation. You die once, and then the judgment, and if you believe in Jesus, you are saved. Okay. And then, of course, there is, uh, Paul says, for, to, for me to live is, in, is Christ and to die is gain. But if I am to live on the, in the flesh, this will mean fruitful labor for me, for I do not know which to choose. But I am hard-pressed from both directions, having desired to part and be with Christ, for this is very much better, yet to remain on the flesh is more necessary for your sake. Basically saying, look, if I leave, I'm going to leave. I'm not going to come back again as a reincarnated person. Okay? So, 
Now, let's get down to it. Well, how do I explain? I just gave you a great bunch of explanations, I mean, evidence of reincarnation being real. And then I went through and I said, the Bible does not prove reincarnation, does not accept reincarnation. In it. So what is the explanation? I can't just leave you with that. I'm like, yeah, thanks a lot, Neil. You haven't explained anything. You just said the Bible. So is that all going to be on faith? No. So first of all, I mean, there is some faith in this, and we'll talk about it. So for the first possibility is it's fraud. Right? These are all fraudulent cases. But if you look at these, all these cases were extensively researched, and they said, there's no way this could be fraud. Now, there are fraudulent cases all over the place, but these cases were definitely extensively researched. Okay? And further, a lot, of, a lot of these by three-year-old, how can three-year-old kids instigate something like this? Right? So it's not fraud. The next thing is what we call cryptomnesia. Right? It's a condition that somebody knows about a person but for, like, forgets the source. So you learn about somebody, and then you forget about it, and then you think, oh, that must be in my own memory, not something that somebody told me. Okay? But this doesn't work if you have never known the person. So Nirmal never knew Gurdip or never knew anybody, and they were 100 miles away. So this could not be an explanation for that. Okay? Now, how about genetic memory? Genetic memory suggests that genetic memory is passed down through a few generations. For a person, somebody experiences it, then has a baby. That memory is genetically encoded in the baby's DNA. And then they have a baby, it's genetically encoded in their DNA. And then that baby wakes up one day and says, oh, I have this memory that my great-grandfather has, and you think you're connected. But the problem is, these people are not related, right? They were far apart. There's no way they were related in this way. So this does not work at all. Okay, ESP. This is possible. And there's more to it, and I'll discuss this in the next thing. So before we do, I want to clarify one thing. I want to explain the difference between reincarnation and retrocognition. Okay, in reincarnation, they make one basic assumption. And this is something you should recognize. The assumption is that cognition implies presence. Okay, that means if I know something, that means I was there to know about it. It's assumed that if a person knows enough details about another person's life, then that person used to be the other. In other words, if I remember a past life, then it has to be my past life that I'm remembering. But if there, is there any reason for this to always be the case? If you were to know, be told in great detail the fact of a person who died, facts of a person who died many years ago, you would not think that was your story because you don't identify with that person. You know it's different. Let me introduce you to a guy named Peter Herkos. Peter Herkos is as stated in his own by way, and you can find all about him on his webpage, peterherkus.com. Uh, he died in 1987, I think. Uh, he stated in his own autobiography, he talks about the first time he had a gift. He had just suffered from a very severe head injury. He was a normal person, suffered from very serious head injury, and was lying in hospital when all of a sudden he said he knew a lot about the man in the bed next to him. In fact, he proceeded to tell the man everything about the man, even though he'd never met him. Herkos later proved to be 80% or more accurate every time. He helped the English police recover the royal jewels that was stolen, the coronation stone of Westminster Abbey. He knew about the thieves. He helped them find the Boston Strangler. Right? And he knew a lot of things. Like He would just say, yeah, I know this about this person, I know these details about this person, I know where this person lives and where he lived, where he grew up. He would know all these details about these people and he couldn't explain how he knew that. And so the police used him and he was 80% and they would say, oh, this guy's a psychic and he kind of referred to himself as he was psychic too. But here's the difference between Peter Herkos and reincarnation. In Herkos's case, most of these people that Herkos knew about were still alive. And two, he did not identify with them. Right? Now, what this means is, see, reincarnation argued that cognition indicates presence. I could not know unless I was actually there to live that life. But the facts from the case of Peter Herkos shows that this is not necessarily the case. You could know about somebody and not be that person. Cognition does not incur in, indicate presence. So in the same way, a young child might, that merely knew in great details about somebody else may be misled or not be able to comprehend why they know this without identifying with a person who they had retrocognition. So what is reincarnation? 
Reincarnation is retrocognition with self-identification. Peter knew the details about the other person, but he didn't think he was the other person. In these claims of reincarnation, they know details about the other person, and they think they are the other person. And I go, oh, well, that doesn't explain much. It just explains how this could be. Well, remember when we talked about Agent X, and Sajid, you weren't here. We do this experiment, uh, we, we explain about at the founding, uh, at, the, at the Big Bang, at the point of the Big Bang, at 10 to the minus 23 seconds, before 10 to the minus 23 seconds after the Big Bang, we have 10 dimensions that we've calculated. I won't go into that detail, I, I, you know, I can send you the information on it. Uh, we, have 10 to the, we have 10 dimensions. Now what are the four dimensions, right? The height, length, width, and time. And there's six other dimensions. So the four dimensions that we know of are the natural dimensions. The other four dim uh, six dimensions are what we call the supernatural dimensions, right? And so, if let's say imagine, and most of you are probably here for that, uh, let's say um, you're a two-dimensional being and you live on a piece of paper. To you, a line is what? A wall, right? Because you can't go, you're two-dimensional, you can't jump over the line. So if, if there's a line here, you're like, oh, I can't go past it. So to you, a room is what? A square, right? Now, if there's a door in that square, you can open the door and walk in because you're two-dimensional. You can't go over the square. But I, as a three-dimensional being, I don't care about your silly lines because I can, what, hop over them. I'm a three-dimensional being. So what science indicates is that we can calculate six other dimensions beyond this dimension. So now think about a four-dimensional being. If a two-dimensional being is locked in a room, we are three-dimensional beings. We're locked in this room that are three-dimensional. We can't get out of this room except through the door. We can't hop over the walls, right? especially if there's a top, because in three dimensions there's a top. But a four-dimensional being could step into our room without anything different from about him, right? So my question is, how did Jesus get into the upper room? In the New Testament, after Jesus rises from the dead, all the apostles are in the upper room, and the doors are all locked, and suddenly Jesus shows up. And they make a point to say, and the doors are locked. And he shows up, and he says, well, how did he get there? Well, he stepped into the room from another dimension, because his body was multidimensional. Now, how does this explain things? Well, let's say that I had a ball, and I put it through my two-dimensional plate, right? When I touch the, the ball touches here, this two-dimensional being will see a dot. And as the ball goes through it, they'll see a circle, and it'll grow bigger and bigger to the size of the diameter of the, of the ball, and then it'll shrink down, down, and down until there's just a dot and it'll disappear. Now, let's imagine there was a three-dimensional being, with a three, and I brought a four-dimensional ball into the space. First, I'll see a dot, and then I'll see a small ball, and then I'll start seeing a bigger ball, and it'll grow, grow to the full size of the ball, and then it would shrink down again as it left our three-dimensional plane, and then would disappear again. And the whole time it would look like it was flying. There's nothing under it, nothing over it, nothing behind it, nothing holding it up. Now, so what is a multidimensional being that intersects our plane? Multiple dimensional being intersects our plane, they would shimmer, they'd look weird, and finally they'd look like a man in that dimension, and then they would shrim out and disappear. Now, I've just given you an explanation for what? Angels and demons. A scientific explanation for angels and demons. I had an argument with an atheist. He goes, oh, well, you're, I said, are you saying that there's no other dimension? He goes, no, no, they are, because he has to admit it, because we have built a large hadron collider, spent $3 billion to send a particle into the fourth dimension. He goes, no, no, I can't, I can't argue with that. Yeah, there are. I said, but what you're arguing, he says, but how can you say they're angels and demons? I said, all you're arguing is that there's no intelligent life in those other dimensions? What are you basing that on? If there are other dimensions, why can't there be intelligent life in the other dimensions that intersect our dimension? He said, well, it's all speculation. I said, it's as speculative as the <laughs> Large Hadron Collider. So if there are angels and demons, and there are, who knows the entire history of other people? And a demon. Right? In fact, the few beings who know everything that has happened in the past, and they know a little about the future, not too much, they can make good guesses about it because they've been around for a long time. They know 
they are able to transmit that. Now, most of the, the ones that we don't, that, that are bad, are not in the realm of, they're not in, in the fold of God. And one of them particularly is the being Lucifer, Satan, who has watched and participated throughout humanity's history. And he knows all about these things. And he's able to communicate information that can be reliably checked out. Imagine you were behind the scenes here saying, I'm going to take this information and I'm going to give it to this two-dimensional king. Nobody would see that interaction, but it would happen. And this two-dimensional being would think that they knew that they were this, especially if they were young. In most of these cases, they're young. Now, I'm not talking about Shirley MacLaine, who I think is making it up. I'm talking about these kids who feel that. In fact, in the Bible, we see this. Paul uh, and Silas, I believe, no, yeah, are walking through the uh, town. And once they were going through a place of prayer, they were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men, the rest of us means Luke, is the guy who wrote this, shouting, these men are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. And she kept us up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned around and said, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. And at that moment, the spirit left her. Now, this is very upsetting to the owners of the slave girl. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. Because suddenly she was not enslaved by this demon and could not tell the truth. I mean, could not predict the future or tell things. In Mark 1.23, there's an incident where a demon-possessed man knows who Jesus is. And before anyone knew, uh, that was before anyone knew that who Jesus was, and he knows who Jesus is. So what is the explanation of reincarnation? It's quite simple. It's retrocognition due to demon possession and self-identification. Right? It's a very logical, simple, clear answer. Can I prove it? No, because I, it's hard to prove demon possession, but I can give you all the logical scientific reasons for it. Right? Yeah, but demon influence and demon possessed, they're, they're different things, right? So. So are these kids demon-possessed? No, I don't think so. Are they demon-influenced? I'm sure they are. So Peter Herkos is a different case. Peter himself claimed to be a Christian. And he did not think, he said, I have these psychic powers, but I don't think they're, he rejected the demons. In fact, his wife is still alive. I would love to go meet her. Um, they, they live in uh, San Diego. So, um, Peter actually, and this is something that's very interesting, I had this conversation with Joel, right? Uh, Joel's a friend of mine, um, and he, and he'll tell you, he experiments with drugs. So one day we're having coffee. He came to my work, and we're having coffee. Was it my work or something? I don't know. We're having this discussion, and, and he said, so if there is a demon world, if there is a multidimensional world, what is the interface to the multidimensional world? I said, well, I would assume it's the brain. How do I interface with, you know, so, because, by the way, so the, and, and tell you this, so I tell people that they don't have souls. People don't have souls. People are souls. What they have are bodies, right? And the body and the soul are fused together in a sense. And when you lose your body, your soul continues, you'll get a new, not a reincarnated body, but a new eternal body when Christ returns, right? So, so Joel and I, we have these great discussions. And he's like, so what is that interface into that multidimensional? I said, it has to be the brain. And he said, okay, so if the brain is damaged, could you suddenly pierce into that multidimensional realm? I said, too. I said, yeah, I guess so. He says, what about if you damage it or if you use drugs? <laughs> I'm like, Joel, uh, yeah, I have, to, I have to give you that, but I'm not suggesting you do that, right? And, you know, Joel, Joel's great. He's, he's, a, he's a friend of mine. He used to be a junior high student of mine. And he's done this uh, deprivation tank business, right? He sits in a deprivation tank. And then he does it with drugs. And it's, he tells it. I said, that would, one, I don't want to do drugs. Two, I don't want to be in a deprivation because I would get claustrophobic. He says, no, dude, it's cool. It's really nice. I'm like, no, thank you. So, but the idea basically is that, so when, what is the interface there? And so my guess 
throughout all these studies and things I've done, is that Peter was actually damaged part of his brain in the accident, because that's part of the story, is he has this big, huge accident that hurts his brain. And in that, when he wakes up, suddenly he has pierced into that multidimensional realm. How or why, I don't know. But Peter himself was adamant that he was not demon-possessed. So, um, and I did some research on him. So, so um, and wh- but talking about demon possession, and we'll wrap this up, is remember, no wonder for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It's not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. So in, in the West, we see so a lot of the demon possession in hypnotherapy, channeling, regression, things like that, where they actually allow you to be possessed. Because uh, the Bible says if you empty your body of something, then the demons will enter, right? In fact, the, the story is where the, a demon is in a man and he gets cast out and he doesn't receive the spirit and so it becomes worse because then the demons come back and multiple of them possess him in the story. So there's a lot more to this topic, um, but um, we'll deal with in the future. But now it's sufficient that reincarnation is not biblical. It's anathema to God. Um, it's if you start, uh, some people do feel they're reincarnated. Maybe that's what happened to Shirley MacLaine. She went through all this channeling and hypno, not hypnotherapy, but the, the, the drugs and all that stuff. So she's opening, <laughs> well, definitely the alcohol. Uh, and so that, that's opening herself out for that. But the, the short answer is that Christ, Jesus Christ has atoned for all our sins once for all on the cross, not for what we can do. It's not karma. It's through forgiveness and repentance. It's a relationship. It's all about relationship. Uh, so there's only one way through. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Thank you. Any questions? <laughs> so that was a very technical talk. <laughs> yeah, so I just had a bunch. And if you, I know we're late, so if you need to leave, please feel, feel free. So thank you for a very enlightening uh, presentation and discussion. I, I just wanted to share... Uh, some additional information for you. And, you know, it's, it's really interesting because if you look at uh, the Tibetan lamas, there, there's actually a whole pecking order of lamas. There's not only the Dalai mm-hmm. Lama below him. There's a Panchen Lama there's, and there's a bunch of others. Yeah, there. there's like a bunch of them, you know. Yeah. And for centuries, they've had a standard method of selecting the next one. Yeah. And, uh, and what, what, what that involves is they actually keep the toys of the of of each of the lamas, and it goes back centuries, and uh, they rely on some high experts like meditation masters to kind of tell the teams that oh the next guy, and it's not just the Dalai Lama, it's the secondary lamas as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the next guy is in that particular direction, and then they have these teams that go into all the villages and. They find like a candidate, and it's always a boy. It's it's male. Yeah, it's a young boy. They'll find a three-year-old boy. Who died? Old. Who was born about the same time as the old lama? Well, so they have a concept of a region who fills in. Yeah. Because there's time for the reincarnation before it finds a new. Yeah, boy. yeah. And then, but what they've historically done is they get these children, uh, these kids, and they they'll run them through a bunch of tests. But the final test, they'll group the toys into two sets. One is the Actual and one is the actual yeah. toys that belong to the previous lama yeah, when he was a kid, and the toys. other set is roughly the same but different. Was and they actually have the kid pick it out, and if the kid makes a mistake, then they conclude this is not the one, and then they they keep searching. Uh, and it's actually very well described in the current Dalai Lama's own autobiography, where there was a bunch of things, and he actually seized them and said, this is mine, you know, it was, like, it was very unequivocal. So I, I'm not saying this proves anything. No, I'm no, just no. saying uh, what you're doing to educate, you, you probably want to look into this. Yeah, no, I, I, I've, so I've read part of that, but I, I don't remember specifically the toy situation, but right. I know there was a but, bunch but of the they, belongings. I'm, I'm saying as, as a statistical thing, you know, if you look, yeah, because if you, yeah, cause if you, you do it enough times, stats, eventually, right, we're statisticians too, you look at it, it's like, Wow, they do this all the time, and they they are very strict about it. If the kid fails that test, then yeah. Then but you go to the next on, one. So what are the yeah? Statistics? Until they find yeah the right. So you know, the statistically, what are the chances that you'll eventually find somebody who makes like choice? Yeah. So, so I mean, there's still the possibility that 
all of this was fraud. You can't, yeah, but again, then there's also the possibility of what we're talking about, retro you know, it, But it could be any of those other possibilities. Yeah. And I don't know. I just wanted to share yeah. that. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And that's okay. very informative. Any other questions? We did most of the questions earlier on. So I think but Lena has. I was actually uh, reading a testimony of a lady. She her she comes from a family of witches her grandmother was a witch and they train their the family lines as well and yes some of the toys so a lot of the training is sorcery witchcraft basically and they train the little kids they they train them like with toys and and they pick different things so yes i think that's part of the training in the in the demo, uh, in the evil realm as well she's a christian actually today so she was sharing so she can, yeah, how her grandmother like they have to is this the book she wrote or something? Um, she, she shared it on like, um, like a Jesse Zebotar is her name. So she, she actually is part of the, uh, she's a chaplain today and she works with a lot of veterans. But anyway, she exposes what happened, like send, what they send do. Send me that link, I'd be interested. Yeah, like a high level witchcraft. Her grandmother was in, it was training her because she was very gifted. Uh, but she became a Christian uh, as a young child, and and that's how the Lord protected her. And now she's coming out to expose <laughs> what's actually they what people do in sorcery and witchcraft. They call it satanic ritual abuse, and she's yeah. trying to help a lot of people come out of that. Like these are people that are, you know, and child trafficking unfortunately is one of yeah, them. Yeah, well, a lot of that is tied She's that. actually speaking up against. Uh, yeah, send, against me, that. send me that link. I'll be sure, sure. Okay. Funny. So I thought it was really interesting that you came up with the brain as being the entryway. Why not the spirit? Because we're talking about... Well, because so the spirit is, is multidimensional. It's in right. the elder, elder realm. It's supernatural. But the body is two-dimensional. So the question is, where does the body and the spirit connect? Because we know the body is temporary. So there's something that's permanent. And that permanent thing is not necessarily in this dimension. So the question is, where is the connection? And so I said the brain, again, this was just a casual conversation we were having. It's not that I've done research on any of that, but the brain seems a natural place where it would go. But uh, other people say, oh no, it's the heart or it's the gut or whatever, right? So there are other places. I'm not, I'm not gonna make a thesis out of it being the brain, but yeah, again, it's possible, right? Yeah. Now, let's say the Russians launch nukes, there's nuclear winter, all the humans die. We're not, there's no remnant anywhere. So basically these religions are going to die because yeah, well, it, it, it relies on reincarnation to right. yeah, keep it cause, going. Because unless everybody achieves karma and neutrality at the same time, yeah, if there is a world destruction, then the thing would fall apart. Yeah. Well, although they might, I, I would argue, I mean, again, since I've had lots of friends on this, they go, well, how do you know they're not, they didn't move to a different planet, right? <laughs> a different body. But I mean, even in the in the case of Tibet, I mean, yeah, the still lamas, here. they're all so yeah. close. Yeah, they're not, in they're not, they're not in you know, the Alpha 6 or something like that. Yeah, yeah I agree. But, but again, I, when I engage with my friends, my Hindu friends about this, they're, remember, they don't need, uh, a lot of my Hindu friends don't need a firm answer. They just need a, a possible thing, which is fine, and I grant them that, so. So, it, so now that if I am going to have the discussion with them and say this is wrong, I better have a firmer answer, <laughs> a firmer example, <laughs> right? So, anyone else? Okay, yeah, one more. This pretty young girl up front. That would happen to be my um, daughter. Yes, hello. <laughs> uh, I think I've asked you this before, but I want to ask you it again relating to this. Is there any connection to this and mental disorders? Because there is a lot, like for instance, yeah. schizophrenia. Um, <laughs> what if, what happens if one of those voices happens to be another person that you've, yeah, so or like, is there a relation to this? And also you said the brain, well, a lot of these yeah, do have to do my, with the brain. But My daughter has, has this habit of asking me questions that befuddle me. <laughs> so she asked me this. I think you were a lot younger when you asked me that. Probably, I can't remember how old you are, but when you asked me that question, and it did make me think is that is, so again, remember, uh, a lot of the demon-possessed people were mad in the Bible. So the question is, is there a, you know, we think of chemical mis dis imbalances and things like that, but is there a spiritual answer to, you know, mental diseases? And I think the answer is yes, there is a connection there, but is it only a spiritual connection, or is it that the brain has been damaged in such a way that it's allowing an influence 
that is not normal into the brain. And that's what's causing this. So, and I had never thought about it until she said, well, what about this? And I'm like, oh, yeah, I guess that's possible. So, <laughs> so yes, absolutely. And I think that's a, it's a real possibility. that, And that's when the Bible says they're possessed by demons and I'll heal you. What is he healing? Is he healing that barrier in the brain that cannot now make, communicate with those things? And so the demons are, free, are unable to influence him, whatever, right? So, yeah, I don't know. Now, I understand, I'm not sure what the situation with abortion, gender-based abortion is in the country of India today. It's very high. It's illegal, but it's very high. Does that lead to a, does that uh, lead to a correlation with greater secularism in that country? I mean, obviously it's bad karma, right? No, because, I don't know, Sajid, I don't know the answer to that question. I, I really don't know the answer, I'd have to. Because Hindus, Hindus don't consider abortion to be wrong, right? So, um, Neil, um, did you say uh, is abortion? I think abortion is legal. Is legal in India. It's right? legal in India, yeah. and but sex selection abortion is legal. Right. So the other thing is like for Buddhists, um, they're actually uh, not really in favor of abortion. Yeah, their Buddhism is pro-life. Buddhism is Pure, very, at least very Buddha pro-life. Was, because Buddha was. Buddhist may not be, but Buddha was pro-life. No, no. So the teaching is not to take a yeah, life. Yeah, not to so, take a life. And, and, you know, life begins at conception. So they're actually very strict. And actually, when we did the religious exemption for my wife for the vaccine, we actually used those, um, those points. Um, yeah. For, yeah. So, but, but I think his question was about Hinduism. I don't, Hinduism is, yeah. I don't know that there's a correlation. So, me, sorry, maybe I missed your question. Uh, it was. So, if 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 abortion is by, but abortion is, yeah. 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 No, yeah. abortion is not considered. It's a bad country trauma. of 1.4 billion people with lots of political parties and all kinds of ideologies. That's just modern reality. Yeah, yeah. So, abortion is not considered bad karma in India. But it's legal. It's, it's got a very large communist party too, <laughs> I, especially in our state. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay, last one, and then we should, we should. Okay, last one, and then we'll wrap it up. Well, just saying, what, kind of based on that, but does uh, does political alliance have anything to do with anything like Marxism and prevalent in India and stuff like that? Um, regarding this and things like that. I yeah. Because um, Marxism says it's a world of oppressors and oppressed. Yeah. And Hinduism has a whole caste system. So how do they deal with that? Are they saying that the Brahmins are the it, well, oppressors or how does that work? It, yeah, I, I think you're looking for... Marxism brings comes up with the oppression oppre on the oppressed so they can manipulate the people. It's not... I don't think there's a real... Yeah, but no, they were called Christians. <laughs> That's the problem. So I had Marxist. All my, I grew, for those of you who don't know, I grew up in a Marxist extended family. My uncles were all very famous communists. Uh, but they were all, most of them were Christians. One was an atheist, but the other two were really devout Christians. And, but they merged Christianity. And, and I talk about that. Confused who was supposed to take care of the poor. It was, they thought it was the government, but it's really the church. But... Um, but if you go to the north, uh, the north were the, the, the Naxalites were communists there, and they were atheists. They were hardcore atheists. And they were, their movement was really bloody, right? I mean, the, the, the communist movement in Kerala was massive. It was <laughs> kind of a friendly, hey, come on, join our group kind of thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm sure it is, yeah. But... Uh, but in, in North India, the Naxalites were, man, these guys were killing people left and right. Uh, and that was an atheistic communist movement. So. Okay. Oh, last one. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but who decides what is good and bad karma? Uh, <laughs> is this too long of a question? <laughs> this is a very valid question. And this is always the question, like, who decides what's right and what's wrong? Now, with Christians, we say there's an objective moral law. In Hinduism... It, everything is a lot of things are relative, and I think it would depend on your tradition. Uh, I think it would depend on your who your yoga yogi is. Yeah. No, no, no. This is in Hinduism, not in Buddhism. Yeah. Yeah. Buddhism, it's very clear. There's an eightfold path, yeah. right? But for Hinduism, it's not as clear, and and you'll see it. 
it's a much more, again, defining Hinduism is a very, very, um, there's, a, there's a story, it's a, it's a Hindu story given, to, given me by a Hindu man when I was first studying this. He said, um, there was a man walking down the street and he ran into a sage, a yogi, right, a guru. And he said, yogi, which god should I worship? And the yogi says, uh, why, why do you ask me this question? He says, well, because there are three million gods. You should worship any one of them. And then the man says, but Yogi, with the three million gods, I want to pick one. Which one should I pick? He says, why do you say three million? There aren't three million gods. There's only 300,000. He goes, well, you just told me it was three million. He says, did I say three million? No. He said, no, but then you said 300,000. He says, no, no, I didn't say 300,000. I said, there's only 3,000. And he keeps going like this. And he finally says, but Yogi, which one of the three should I worship? He says, what three? There's only one. That is the Brahman. <laughs> right? So it's like, <laughs> it's like trying to find, and this is a Hindu story, it's because the reality of Hindu philosophy is that we don't know, there are just so many different, but it all ends up in Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu, and all of them end up in the Brahman. So it's, mm. there really is one God, three manifestations, which is very similar to Christianity, and this is why my dad talks about the similarities of where Christianity and Hinduism merge, and maybe and his suggestion is actually the Hinduism we know today came out of Christianity, whereas before that it was more pantheistic and animistic. Right? So the answer is nobody knows. It really depends on. But I should ask him. I should ask my dad. He'll tell you. I'll, I'll ask him. I'll send him an email tonight and see if okay. he answers. So. Good question. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate it. If you have any more questions, come up. Sajid, as always. Thank you, Sajid. Hand to Sajid. <laughs>